Good afternoon and welcome to the Firefish Crane class. Thanks for joining us. I'm delighted here. We've got a slightly different guest today. We have um, Edwin, and I've just checked it's Arbel, although it's spelled A. L A B L, but I'm I'm sure there's a silent R in there somewhere uh, joining us, and um, he's going to be sharing some really good thoughts about leadership and what we need into um, today's leadership for uh, the recruitment world. Um, now, before I get started, because we go back a wee bit of uh, time, don't we, Edwin? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Edwin's come from the recruitment world, uh, I think computer people and uh, lots of IT recruitment experience, and then he challenged me back in about 2017 as a very forward thinking client and kept me on my toes. Um, and that's why I was always impressed with you uh, because essentially you constantly were pushing boundaries and you were taking things to the next level and wanting more. And you've then since followed, I've tracked your career and you've been working in house, you've done agency, you're now working within the sector, but from a different sort of um, uh, company, which we'll hear more about as well. But you've always kept, um, Every Sunday I get a little ping and I've got your weekly briefing that you keep inspiring me with leadership topics and aggregated content. Mm -hmm. um, so that got me thinking in terms of, you know, what are you doing now and and, and where are you bringing this sort of new think leadership skills into the world? So just before I go, can you just sort of elaborate a little bit more about sort of your background and, and where you're coming from and then we'll dive straight into the topic. Yeah, no, cool. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. So um, I I began my career in uh, yeah in recruitment back in 2003, which seems a long time ago now. Uh, I, I worked as sort of cold desk at uh, at computer people, uh, and then uh, worked there for four years overall. Uh, sort of led, when I left as sort of sales manager type level, so I was individual biller, and then did okay for a few years, um, specifically in IT recruitment um, uh, type of area. Then I set up my own business and did that for uh, six or seven years after that. Initially started doing sort of consultancy, bit of recruitment uh, type work, and then actually made a sort of career transition into more of a startup advisor, marketing consultancy and go to market sales um, type advisor. And, and then I can't really remember how I transitioned, but it was just a, a natural organic thing of moving into that, having an interest in, in, in that type of work. and. And um, and then that led me to um, where I kind of went more, more morphed into the B2B and tech SaaS like world. Uh, I joined an American organization called uh, Aperio, which were a um, SaaS uh, Salesforce.com partner. And uh, that's where I picked up my main sort of, I guess, most relevant experience today, where specifically leadership, we grew that business. Uh, expanded to six odd regions in Europe. I ran the marketing function. Uh, that company got acquired by Wipro for, uh, for 600 million. Uh, I left and joined then uh, another organization as the CMO uh, called Hive Learning, founded by Clive Woodward, which is a learning tech app for a venture capital group. And, uh, and then brings me on to today where I'm at a company called Modular. I'm in Edinburgh, so Shemma. I know you, you were down in London, and now I'm doing a crowdcast, and you're just you're just yeah. the other side of us. <laughs> Maybe popped along to, to yeah. and uh, yeah, and the modular we're a, we're a, well Edinburgh, London, and Dublin based organisation. We're a payments API platform. We're scaling very rapidly. Uh, we've gone from about 40 staff to about 180 now uh, in the in a period of 12 months. And um, and obviously looking to grow and expand into Europe. So um, so yeah, so that's my background. Yeah. Main main bulk of that has been um, scaling, building teams, building pipeline, go to market, and all that type of uh, good stuff. And I think that doesn't surprise me because it's an awesome journey you've taken is that, you know, you've always aligned yourself with um, either destructive brands or something else that's sort of pushing it and fast paced. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's where I think, you you know, you've got such a good insight in terms of the different types of leadership, because when we started you know, back in recruitment and how you used to lead and how you used to coach or how you used to train, mm -hmm. um, very different to what it's now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, can you share a little bit of insight as to what you think makes a good leader in, in recruitment these worlds? Yeah, I mean, if you look at it in recruitment um, specifically, yeah, I mean, you're right. When I joined recruitment originally, uh, my actual onboarding was um, sat in a room watching Tony Byrne videos. Yeah, definitely. People. I think we still have people on the side that uh, will will have done the same. Oh, yeah, yeah. The I don't know if that's still used or the VHS has been converted to uh, <laughs> 
on that. But uh, that was my main training. And then I don't really think there were leadership principles in there. But I, I, I remember one of the VHS tapes, the, the leadership modules were certainly not um, conducive to what leadership should be. Um, it was sort of very, very old school and, uh, and traditional. And, I, and obviously not being involved in recruitment right now, but um, I guess I picked up my first leadership experience in recruitment leading a team I think two years in was when I got promoted to team leader and then final two years had a team and um, basically I think actually the time in recruitment there taught me how to be a really bad leader I mean you've always got to learn somewhere but I think that's really interesting like what what would explain bad leader in your well, eyes right I, now well I, I think it's nothing to do with the industry I think it's just that um, you, you're quite young you get put in charge of people and the way you're trained and and developed is very KPI driven, uh, like daily outputs every day. Um, there's not much um, consideration for individualism. It's all sort of right. Our company runs our business this way, and we have our KPIs run this way. And this is this is the revenue number we need, and we track back all the way to individual consultants and what revenue and habits they need to deliver on a daily basis. Because I remember having my right, my billing goal is for thirty thousand a month. That means I need six offers each month. That means I need uh, 15 final interviews, which means I need 27 first interviews, which means I need to submit four CVs a day, which means now I need to speak to 15 candidates per day. And I think the thing that I, that happened to me was then when I went into that role, because I kind of grasped that and thought, okay, it works, process is good. You then just try and put the exact same process into your whole team and, and just purely do it on, um, on sort of the metrics and you don't actually think about the broader aspect of building a connected team and the importance of individual motivation and the importance of coaching um you, you know it was my my style then was what i'd kind of i didn't really know any different was very black and white oh you haven't done your thing today you're rubbish um you, there was no approach to coaching um you know even things like um as you know there's a really good simple coaching model called grow which is um which people should look up which is just a simple framework if you're doing one-to-ones with people um where you just sort of goal you know reality um outcomes and then the will of what you're looking to do and then you follow this this simple uh, framework every time with people um is, is, is a nice way to do it and so i guess back to the point so i you know i learned bad leadership skills there but i think you have to it's very hard for someone to step into a leadership role and know what they're doing Mm -hmm. because you don't really know what you're doing um it, it, to be frank you've got to learn as you go um but what that experience taught me i think was the grounding of um you know it, it wasn't working great in the sense of performance wasn't performance was okay but it wasn't fantastic i was doing okay my other team members were me you know not in a bad way in terms of them but mediocre but i wasn't helping them perform at their best and so i got got that wrong and then i think so how i reflected on that was you need to a you need to go and learn from mentors and other people and and, and um, get their experience and then also um, I think we we've talked lots about and learning is key uh, you've got to I think that was at the point where I realized right really got to you if you're really interested in leadership and doing it properly you've got to go and then be a sort of voracious learner around leadership topics. And that includes, you know, reading articles, reading books. And it's quite simple to say that, but it's hard to execute um, in, in, in actual, uh, in, in how you go about it. And, and that's the biggest advice I would give, like just learn, if you're a first time leader, step one, just learn as much as you can. Um, you know, the best books out there are, uh, the best one I read three months ago, was Trillion Dollar Coach, um, Bill Campbell, who, um, who uh, mentored uh, some of the best CEOs in Silicon Valley, like Steve Jobs um, and Eric Schmidt. Uh, there's other ones called Dream Manager, The Leader You Want to Be. Um, uh, there's a great book by Mark Benioff, Cheryl Blazer, which has just come out around sort of authentic leadership from a CEO. And, and what, are, what are the key themes that you were sort of taking from those books? Well, so the key, the key themes, if you look at Trillion Dollar Coach, uh, Cheryl Blazer, and um, actually leader you want to be is, is, is the whole framework is based on coaching, clear communication and having a vision to inspire people. Mm -hmm. I think they're like the core components and then there's a, lot, there's a lot underneath that. I mean, if I think about the core, 
core sort of components of what a great leader is for me or what I've learned from others. It's, it's um, so I've written down here sort of six points. One is clear communication, mm -hmm. not really clear to people, but um, be upfront and honest. And a bit like the grow model um, is work through like where the reality of where people are at, where they want to go to try and get through to what their real um, motivations are. I think a good, a good um, exercise in that regard, actually, there was, there's this thing called sixes and sevens where you can sit down with people. Um, and the, the, the concept is that if you ask someone, what do you want? Their instant response might be, I want money. Mm -hmm. um, but the six and seven model is you, you keep quizzing down the, that, that hierarchy. So you would say, great, OK, you want money. What's the reason you want money? And then someone will give you a second answer. You know, they may not know the answer. They'll just say, uh, because I want a house and say, OK, but why, why do you want a house? And then they'll have to think a little bit deeper. And then the point of the six and seven is that once you drill down and keep asking, layering the questions, on the sixth or seventh or eighth answer will be the one they've really truly thought about and the reason why deep down they really are motivated because there's something underlying in there and they're only gonna, it's only gonna come out to the fore once you really drill into the detail on it. And if you can get that with everyone you're leading and understand their true deep motivations and the purpose of what they actually really do want out of work and life, then, then that's really critical to then managing the group as a whole. So communication is one. Uh, vision, I touched upon it. All the best people I've worked for, they, you just, you, they, they inspire you with a vision of you're going somewhere and you, you believe in them uh, and you believe in their own authenticity. Um, humble is another one. I think all, all the best ones, people I worked with, humble, they're, you know, likable um, and, and care about people. I think so that's big. Um, having the coaching, the coaching met, uh, mindset. I mentioned the learning piece, being great learners. Again, it's easy to say you're a learner, but whether you are really learning every day is a different thing. So the best leaders are voracious learners at the same time. Uh, mention the coaching mindset. And then the final one, which I think is important, is, is, is the, the biggest learning I've had, the, the, which is a real extra interesting one, is just being in the detail. Um, I know this is necessarily linked to coaching and other things, but the best leaders I've worked with and the things I've picked up to try and pass on to others is, is the, the detail and this thing called sort of second order thinking, which is, is, is all about sort of lateral thinking. And I've learned that from CEOs I've worked with or the venture capital companies. They have this amazing ability to think about every scenario in a lateral sense, like not one scenario is just like a linear outcome. Uh, you know, like the, the scenario you're in has a linear outcome and you discuss that, but great leaders just think of 10 different ways of looking at it yeah. and then have 10 different ways of solving it or ideas to help solve it. And then they, they never settle with the obvious answer. And that's what second order thinking is. It's not, it's the first order is the obvious. If you can go a layer down and think, think laterally about all these scenarios, eventualities, solutions, challenges, then, then, um, then, it, then you can really sort of 10x your, um, your approach to things. And um, yeah, so that, I guess that would be mine. No, that's good. And I think, you know, there's lots of things I've just picked up on there in terms of, you know, the first motivation. I think we're, as recruiters, we've been almost trained as first thing you do when you're recruit, you know, when you're going for a job as a recruiter, you know, you're told as a manager, only go and get somebody that's motivated by money because that's what you know they're meant to say so as, as somebody coming into the sector they think oh I've got to tell them I'm motivated by money but as you're quite right you know actually that's one of the the least motivating things in terms of when you dig down yes it's an outcome but it's not what sort of actually gets somebody jumping up and um into work every day and, and using using that information but I think for a new leader coming through you know, um, may have good questioning skills, interviewing skills to get that down to that sort of level with candidates and with, with their team leads or, um, you know, the ma the people that they're recruiting from. What do they do with that? How do you then start to spark in and use that uh, information to, to bring that, as you said, a connected team? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think if, um, so when I look at the team as a whole, so if you're, um, well, two scenarios. If you're building a team from scratch, and per personally, that, that's been actually a lot of my experience building from scratch, which I have to say can be easier because you're going to hire people that you bought on and that you, you feel are in this sort of mindset. Yeah. So not 
similar as a person because that's not correct. Like, you shouldn't hire people with the same as you, but you should hire people with the similar ethos or philosophy perhaps because that's the thing they'll buy into. And, um, and so I think you, you've got to structure it. I mean, you've got to, leadership is, is about structure and process. It sounds boring, but uh, you can't like wing it in terms of, right, we'll do a team outing in every two weeks and that, that keep, keeps a, a team together. You've got to think of it as like a full program. Okay, so I've got my broader team. What, what do I do to build trust across the group as a whole? Um, uh, and how do I roll that out in a structured way? And that's, that's different components. One can be activities and team building. One could be the day-to-day. -day. One could be how you structure your one-to-ones. One could be how you structure your team meetings. How do you then structure people that work for you directly, that manage people, to follow the same process to, to, to structure them um, is important. And then once you have the team structure in place, how do you then manage individuals as individuals and know their individual um, uh, sort of desires and, and, and then how you can you motivate them and, and to do that and, um, and and as a team structure perspective uh, it's it's really important the trusting is huge I'll give you an example of a good trust exercise might sound a bit of a tough one but if uh, if you've got your team on a, an away day uh, a powerful trust exercise is to sit everyone opposite each other and um, and then spend two minutes um, rotate Depends how big your team is, to how long that will take. Uh, ours took quite a long time when we did it. And, and um, you have one minute each to tell the other person how you feel about them. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, so the question is, how, how do I make you feel? And then that person has to tell you how they make you feel for a minute, and then it swaps to the other person, and then you continually go, go around the whole group. It's, it's incredibly, uh, it's a bit awkward to, to start with. Uh, some people hate it, um, but then you find everyone gets value from it because you, everyone learns something from it. And also, it's just a great foundational way to build trust with each other. And also people, build. The, the biggest thing about trust is feedback and, 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 um, and you know, the, being comfortable to have open conversations. Yeah. And if you're a, managing a group or an individual, the only way you will be a great leader is to make sure that you, you, they will trust you and you can um, and, and they'll be open with you and, and that's the other thing actually feedback the reason why you do that is feedback one of the most critical things of, of, of if you're a leader go and seek feedback every day rather than um, it, it, it can be painful but the more feedback you get the more you can adapt and learn and change your approach and adapt approach to then what works and drives performance so I was quite excited about this new trust um, game there, but I'm just thinking because I've got my focus day coming up with the the trips, um, and this is when we every six months we revisit our our goals. Um, we then do a team building exercise, and I'm just wondering. I'm not sure it's the right thing to do though, because our team exercise this this year or this six months is axe throwing. So <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure if we have them lined up and uh, let's be honest, one another, and then throw axes at one another. So yeah. maybe. I'll yeah, might not, be the, might, might not be the best of how I think yeah. it is really good because essentially what you're saying, because the, the, the pace of of the industries are moving so quickly now that, you know, this whole sort of like, if you're going to fail, fail fast and it's OK to make mistakes. And, um, and and I do think in terms of the recruitment world, you know, that relation or that sort of um, uh, drawback to just KPIs and output is because what we know. Mm. But every recruiter now is it can't be the same you know there are different jobs stemming off in the recruitment world and actually seeing them in different teams in different lights um and being able to sort of trial and error things i think is 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 definitely today's world in recruitment a skill that we we, we definitely have to to learn more about um the one thing that i you know you are such a structured person um, because, you know, the, the reason why, you know, it's been, you know, a number of years and I got back in contact with you, as I, I mentioned just in the intro, is this weekly briefing that you um, send through. So you aggregate a lot of content and you send a, a weekly briefing on uh, on leadership topics and you nicely sort of highlight lots of top, lots of best content that week um, and uh, filter it through for me. So thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, Amy will be able to post a, a wee link to, to your briefing because it's, it's really good. Culture, leadership, what's the other area that you, you think yeah, sales marketing or? Three parts. So one is 
links, aggregated links around leadership and well-being and, and um, uh, sales and marketing. The second is just one piece of advice, which sort of, I've, it's more of a Q&A, someone's asked yeah. me in the week, and then thirdly, it's just a recommendation, I could take a product into your product, product. Which is great. But I was talking to you in the green room just before we came on about this, and I said, you know, how, how did this all start and how much time does it take? Um, and, it, and, and I was really interested to hear, can you just sort of repeat that story in terms of how much work you put in to aggregate this, uh, all this content for us? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so the original premise of it started was when I, I mean, but, uh, I can't remember when I started, but I, I started sending a weekly email to my team with um, sort of an aggregated set of links. Uh, the purpose of that was I was really cared about, um, the, you know, the importance of instilling a learning m mindset in people because I, you know, I, I experienced from people that I learned off and saw how powerful it was. So the intention was to not to ram it down their throats, but give people the opportunity, like without themselves going to look for stuff. Here's some really good articles around leadership, selling, marketing, whatever. I felt was interesting at that point and uh and i thought oh hang on my, my team used to like it so i just started a, a newsletter every week to offer it to to external people i still send that and then uh, also i evolved that in my team to a daily motivation note uh every morning i pop a, a note to my team uh, so I, I do it every single morning between 6 and 8 a.m it's either some form of useful article or a piece of advice or something I've seen that I think might be helpful. Often I adapt that from conversations I have with my team, aka someone said, oh, I'm really down this week. So um, on the Thursday, I'll post something which might be a bit more, I know, cheesy and motivational to, to help them get through a slump, you know, and then the next day might be more of a practical skill. Uh, and, and, um, and so I think that's important. You know, again, it's like the helping them, coaching them to develop their, their mindset every single day is, is critical. And people appreciate you for it because they see you're trying to help them develop. And, yeah. and then it, again, helps just another aspect in that tr trust equation. And I guess the process I go through, I mean, again, incredibly geeky. I've, you know, I use Feedly to aggregate tons of, tons of content over 300 sources, which I review all the time. I have Evernote with 50 odd folders and tags with different folder kind of themes which I plug articles into uh, all the time. I, I read Medium every day and save the articles to that. I um, I read a lot of books. I was saying, I so I set a goal each year of, of this year is 25 books and then I sort of tick them off every time I read one. So I do a countdown. So I use snippets of that to share with it and save snippets in Evernote. Uh, I've used Blinkist as well, which is okay. It's, it's a bit light on detail, but it enables you to Learn, you know, you can read 50 books in a week if you want. That makes you sound good. I remember when I was having a good week. I read 30 this week and they said, how, how on earth do you do that? And then obviously I read them on Blinkist, which isn't quite as good. But uh, so, yeah, I pull all these in a way. I generally read first thing in the morning, put, you know, kind of all these different contexts together and then um, save them all in the various sources. And then uh, whichever ones are most applicable, I share out to the rest of the people I work with or the, uh, the newsletter. It's fantastic because you know you you are you're very much encouraging, pointing to the direction of that curiosity, which is just one of the main skills that I think you know self learning that we've talked about as well. You have to be doing. It's just no longer right to be able to sort of sit there and expect to be coached or expect to be trained. You know, it's a two way process and it's a constantly evolving um, you know development process. So I mean, yeah. I, I'm I, I'm I'm not sure I would be. Um, I don't know if I would be looking forward to your motivational message every day, but I think I would get used to it. I might try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, there are definitely more on the team who prefer it than others. I yeah. But at the end of the day, the overall intention is there to try. I like, I, I know, I, I, I jest, but I think it's fantastic, um, which is really good. And, and one of your last articles that really caught my attention, which is to do with the other elements of leadership as well as building, you know, building that culture of trust, as you had. Just on a very um, good post about uh, culture and purpose in yeah. progressing from you know having this intangible culture to really focus on that per that purpose. Yeah. And I think you can't really be a leader if you're not sharing that that purpose and, and bringing that into the company. Do you want yeah. to just share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, the the reason I wrote that post actually was off the back of reading the Trailblazer Mark Benioff book, which is which is a great read if you are if um. Uh, whoever you know is out there wants to read it it's um and interested in you know visionary leadership and what he's done at salesforce 
which is which is you know to be admired i think um but the principles i've always thought about just kind of prompted me to write it i think where i was coming from with that is you've got two things you've got culture you've got purpose everyone talks about culture you go to an interview what's the culture like uh you you know someone asks you as a leader what's the culture like in your organization you tell them everyone's sort of obsessed with culture and culture's been inspired you know kind of the thing that everyone talks about and it's kind of a little bit me too now i think the whole culture piece um you know we've got snooker tables great culture i think what people are looking for and what what it highlights in the mark benioff book is around going into this sort of fifth industrial revolution phase where leadership is about actually not just um you know culture it's about it's, it's not just a, it's, it's about societal purpose as well and that's a, a lot around and that's actually in addition to what the expectations of a lot of gen z and um, new millennial new people not millennials um going gen z is going into the workforce around you know they want something to believe in from from a ceo or a leader that is not just around profit and revenue but is around the the overall impact of the organization or the purpose of that organization overall how you can then apply that individually is pur purpose doesn't have to be uh, you know you can create purpose in a two-man team yeah um it, it you don't have to be a ceo to create purpose you can create you, you don't have to, purpose is not um oh i've got two people on my team how do i give them purpose right we're gonna go and rescue whales or dolphins or something that's not necessarily purpose it's, while i recruit in between <laughs> yeah while i recruit recruitment um it, it's just around sort of try again it's just around digging into the real values of like you know we all have to work and, and have a, you know and, and make money and have a job um, for most people but that you can still create fun and an underlying purpose of why you're here and, and why you're what you're doing is valuable and purposeful and connect with something in recruitment for me actually the purpose was always i you know recruitment's tough you have good days you have bad days the purpose for me was i genuinely really enjoyed those moments of helping people either get a job or or um you know or, or, or that whole process of coaching them around interviews and so my although when i was having an awful day the, the thing and purpose i'd connect down to was my i'm, I'm actually here I'm, I'm trying to help people you know get a role i'm not just some recruiter just trying to make some money from billing i i, I genuinely cared about getting them a, a, a good role or working with candidates and then that made me feel good then uh, and then over the years you build great connections with people and then people start coming back. I think that's the great thing about recruitment. You people keep coming back to you and you get referred and they, you know, you you're really helping someone out. Mm -hmm. And that so I think um big picture, yeah, like CEO purpose is around societal, how does your company impact society and how you drill that down. If you layer it down, you as a leader, however big your team, you can all you need to do is go and reflect, talk with your team, talk to individuals, understand your inner purpose, and then give people something to believe in and connect with. That slightly more than just um, you know hitting a profit number because in a way if you get them people engaged you get the processes right you get structure right then it's not a given but ultimately you're more likely to then be successful and and do revenue numbers exactly and and I think you know it's also about I think as an industry we try to be too much to everybody um and it is being then committed to this is actually where you fit and and it doesn't matter you know other people won't won't sort of see that as their purpose or their values that's mm -hmm. okay you know yeah. it'll be somewhere else for them um because if you did take them on board they're not likely to get the same outputs as you're going for and, and i think that's also something to be brave with uh, when you're developing your leadership skills. You know, it's that self-awareness and then taking it into your style of, of, of coaching leadership and, and uh, developing that sort of purpose uh, around yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. And one tip as well for, I guess, when you look at leadership and managing people and, and going back to the money point, some people are motivated by money, obviously, and that's fine. Um, uh, I think what you'll find is in the quadrant of, yeah, hundred percent of people. It's it's going to be the minority, right? In terms of the real meaningful reason why they want to be happy at work, or they want to, they they are content and you know do, doing something they enjoy. Um, a, a good way to do that in terms of management style as well. So I have this technique called sort of I call it high performance habits mm -hmm. uh, with, with everyone in my teams uh, and, and even people that don't directly report to me are managed in this way. And that's and that's creating a a scorecard of, of of certain habits that is applicable to the role that they're doing so whether that be um and, and both based in three parts like talent 
talent team and uh, personal mm -hmm. and what you define in there is different habits that are critical to the role that they're doing so in, in a way it's actually kind of you could align it to a sports analogy like someone who is playing a certain role in a sports team or an individual sports team but they have all these things that that layer up to why they're successful you know they're either good at running or yada yada or, and what they're trying to do they're never perfect at it they're trying to optimize it and that's the thing you, with people you never you never you've never nailed it you, you know you never nail it 100 um and and so what we do each month or every other week in our one-to-ones is you grade your, they it's not a performance review they self-reflect and grade themselves out of 10 on where how they've been um and 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 sometimes they can give themselves an eight sometimes they can give themselves a three a five it can move around it's not a it's not always an arbitrary okay, number yeah. uh, and then we have focused behaviors and then so then on the the other scorecard attached to it, we have three focused behaviors um that we agree with each other right what are the areas that you're having a challenge with at the moment and how can i help you overcome those what are the three behaviors that you're looking to develop an example of that would be um poor communication skills in team meetings so we have a focused behavior together of right an improvement in your communication skills every one-to-one -one they self-reflect on where they are again on that on a scale of one to ten and then we'll discuss that 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 scaling and um i call it the world class scorecard as well because what we try to do is um, a bit like how we do our when we do our team meets around we present and we grade each other. Yeah. yeah is, is that uh, you know someone will go oh nine and, and I'll always say right so guys a, a nine or a ten is Barack Obama public speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's work to those levels. So if it's a free, it's a free. Like don't be uncomfortable with that. It's not doesn't mean you're terrible. It just means you're not world class. If you've got aspirations to really be world class. You need to realize you're a free you know it's the same with me I'll, I'll do it and i'll be like probably a four i'm i'm nowhere near a good public speaker as Barack Obama, but i want to improve and get better so then how do i reflect on getting better mm -hmm. raising the score so that's a good way i found sort of it's not a performance review it's an ongoing sort of behaviors and the type of habits that you're working together with them on and the important thing is that it's it's also um they have inputs into it and they grade themselves like you i don't give them a grading they grade themselves and then we discuss and reflect on why they've given themselves that grade and then we talk about how they can progress and develop the skills to improve the areas that they want to improve in awesome and just uh, give me a flavor um and i know we're just coming up for the last sort of five minutes or so but just give me a flavor how much time you've got a team right now you're growing obviously fast growth company again so yeah. just now they're around 15 i know you've got um plans to accelerate that really quickly um but how much time do you spend with your team on a weekly basis or a monthly basis what's the sort of you know because it's it, it seems yeah. like it's quite intense yeah <laughs> i Probably if I was to ask my team, they maybe would say it's intense to some degree. Um, but I think um, but I think that's because it is important, I think, to to, to be constantly engaged. And um, and then also when I am not around, you know, if I have to travel for a week, the, the key thing then about leadership is if you've if you've created that structure in place um, around, you know, how you communicate and um, the 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 um, you know the kind of the actions of the teams or the behaviors of the team even when you're not around and and like I say to them all the time everyone should focus on self-governing and self-leadership and, and being being leaders in their own right like everybody should take responsibility for being a leader um, and that's the best way also to be not be micromanaged if you're more proactive and you're you have a more leadership approach in yourself because then you don't need to be micromanaged um, as much which which I always say and and, um, and so yes I guess in some ways intense I mean I guess we have um, I have a one-to-one -one every week with my direct reports, um, uh, and that that one-to-one -one is directly focused on running through the, you know, the scorecard I talked about, and then coaching them around that grow model, and then how we're progressing, and then I then have a second one-to-one -one which is more around the work aspects, so what we call steer codes. So the one-to-one -one is more a behavioural. How do we what do we need to do in terms of um, you and your development and personal development? And then, so uh, many like a coaching session, there's the second yeah. more a, right, let's get a list up. What are you working on? What's your priorities? When's that being delivered? When's this has been delivered? What are the metrics looking like? Where are we now? Where do we need to be in a week? So much more sort of metric driven. So two of those each week, and then everyone who works for me, then who has direct reports, then do the same structure in terms of weekly one-to-ones. We have a team meeting each month. Each Monday, we have a 
team close on a Friday. Yeah. Um, kind of regular standard stuff, but the, the consistency and then and then overall every day, you know, the daily motivation email. We I do make an effort to go and you know kind of you know talk to the team during the day as much as possible. Um, pretty much meetings all day, but if, if I can, you know, go and talk, talk to them as much as I can. But that, that's why. And the, the great thing to see is when um, individuals throughout the team start embracing that sort of leader, leader mentality. Yeah. And then the, the hardest thing of a leader then as well is sometimes you're, actually it's, in a way it's a beautiful thing, you're out of the equation and in a way you're kind of meaningless mm-hmm. because then everything's self-governing and you can see the sharing and collaboration happening and and people taking responsibility for things. And in a way you sit back and think, well, we've actually got no purpose here, but then that's I your role. That's absolutely end goal. So that- Yeah, it, that's just your you role. That. <laughs> yeah, the, if you are being an effective leader, you, you probably would feel weird because you'll feel like you're not doing anything, which is not, but that's kind of where you want to be because that means you've developed a set of people who are, um, you know, who are kind of taking responsibility for things and sort of having that leader, leader sort of growth mindset, which is really important. No, I mean, absolutely. And I think that that is such a goal to go to. So I'm going to bring it back just um, just to sort of finish up there, because, um, you know, for some people listening, that may, gosh, that feels so far away yeah. so for, for just starting to change from, you know, there will be many people sitting there thinking, gosh, I'm just getting I'm coming in and I'm doing my KPIs still exactly how you started. So what would be the first couple of things that they could start to change their behavior in order to start to develop that self-governing leadership to then be able to take that beyond and really push their career forward in recruitment yeah i think i think the important thing is um and recruitment has changed Im- immensely you know over the years and and um obviously got many friends in the space as well and they've, they've briefed me about how the culture within recruitment companies has changed from from when i was in it um, many years ago and and so I think if I you know if I was a first time right I just got my team for the first time I mean first off is to sit and reflect and think right what 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 sort of team environment do I want what charter do I want with my team like how do we want to operate as a group and bring them into that process so sort of um, well how I do it so talk back to my process join modulo so no one in the team so first off you then hire your first 10 people so you've got 10 people on your door on a monday right what you do is first you educate them about you so i provide them with a sounds a bit weird but um a document about me for five five okay now you're getting a wee bit weird (laughs) yeah about sort of like this is how i work this is how i think um you know i'm here to help you you know if you're successful i'm successful um sort of level set of like because they've got to understand you know when i do this it's because of this uh-huh. If I ping you asking you this twice, the only reason I'm doing it is because the, you haven't set the context. So like, so that, so phase one, they're understanding how you think. So you can start that, that development as a sort of their manager. Um, it's important do it either face to face or, you know, I kind of provide a document and then I follow up face to face. It's sort yeah. of the way I do it. And then, and then depending on how many people you've got from two people to 20, whatever it might be, you need to think about how you then, Bring that team together as a first starting point so maybe just have a look you know assess meet everyone individually see where they're at you know can't try and get that initial baseline people don't open up straight away it takes the time process trust to do it but try and try and get a baseline i would one of the first things then organize sort of not team building but you need to get the team together um you need to then build what i'd call sort of a team charter and way of working as a group that's agreed with everyone and so, you know, again, they've re- they saw how you think, how and how, you know, I, or how I think. Then the second stage is get them understand how they want to work, how they want to operate as a team. You define behaviours like so. We have our team charter, you know. So one of our behaviours is, you know, no no moaning at the water cooler. Um, it, it you know, so that's like on our team charter. That was agreed through the whole team because we don't want negative. Um, negativity in the group we want to it's not about being positive for the sake of being positive it's just moaning doesn't help the ultimate the best solution to moaning is right yes there's a problem yes there's a challenge or yes there's a scenario how do you have conversations that solve that solution or how do you talk about it to make it better and then so i would bring that group charts together i would then reflect on sort of uh, your actual overall purpose like what what kind of purpose you want to build into the team how do you want to connect with them and then build then a uh, a sort of structured process around cadences on uh, how do you want to 
how do you want to run your one-to-ones? How do you want to run the team meetings each week? How do you want to um, set expectations for what a good week looks like? So again, just overall structure of mine, Monday morning, we do sort of an energizer before at the start of our meetings, um, uh, because we all agree that's Monday morning. We, we don't want to get drilled straight away on KPIs. It's like get a bit of fun going. Then we get the discussion going, talk about rocks in that meeting, like what are the big problems, get an engaged group of people discussing things together. And then Fridays on the wrap ups, we do a sort of what's been achieved that week. Everyone writes a report of what they've done that week uh, into a shared folder, a shared document um, that then everyone can look at what everyone's done and see what they're accountable for. And, and then so think about that structure is, is what I do. And then, um, and then the other bit is just then uh, the final component to it in phase one, and then it is just then looking to build trust individually with people. And to do that, you have to spend time with people. You have to understand why they're here. You know, why, why are you working here? Like what's, you know, dig into all those questions I've talked about, but get to know them. They're not going to open up or want to form a relationship with you if you don't want to get to know them. And if you, if you don't care about someone that's working for you, then you're never going to be a good leader. So you've got to, you, then that full trust takes months and months and months and months to develop, but mm -hmm. you, you should start that straight away. Um, so if, I, if, if that's how I would think about it. If I no, I, and I think that's excellent. And I, I, again, I smile when you wrote down that document. I actually think it's very valid because what you're doing for step one is say, right, okay, this is where I am, but this is where I want to go down and I'm actually going to put a bit of commitment to it and I'm going to write it down. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not you share that with other people is or verbalise it is, is your choice, but you're taking stop and actually starting to then sort of layer, okay, this is where I want to change things. This is where I'm happy what I want to do. And then you start to get others involved. And really what you did there, Edwin, was you just layered it up, mm -hmm. you know, and then you put the communication channels in, which was really, um, really smart how you did that. Yeah. Um, so I think anybody that wants to change their career right now, you know, that that is take a stop, think about where you want to go um, mm -hmm. start to read and start to learn, be curious with everything you're doing um, and then just ultimately start to then align yourself with people with the same purpose and the same vision and join together as to where you want to what you want to achieve um, and, and, and I think you're demonstrating it in, in all the companies that you've been with in terms of what you've been able to achieve and and you know in the fast pace having that sort of element of structure allows fast pace growth and really it, you know I, I can't see any recruiter that doesn't want that um, yeah. But I do see a lot of recruiters struggling with that or recruitment leaders struggling with it. So I'm, I'm really hoping that today we've, we've shared some good principles there in order to change that behaviour. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I thank you so much for giving me your, your thoughts. If you haven't tuned into your weekly briefing, it is is really good. Um, you know, I, I, I love it. Every, every weekend I get something from it. Um, so please keep doing it because I know that you do it for the good of good of everything, just like you know, producing all the content. But please do, um, and yeah, I'm sure you you know everybody should be getting sus subscribed into it as well, um, and they'll enjoy it just as I do the weekend. Yeah. Um, so I think Amy will just pop in. I think we can connect on you with uh, LinkedIn, and um, I'm sure you're open to any messages or or connections sure. in there as well. Um, anything else you want to add to finish up on? Or no, I think um, I, I I think the hard I've... I think the um, the hardest thing of, um, about being a leader actually is that um, it, it never ever ends; it evolves, and that's why the learning components are important. I'm I'm not like complete by any stretch of the imagination. I think complacency is your biggest risk. Then, as a leader, you have to be on it every single day around everything that you do, and you have to care about that. And and there's books coming out all the time. There's people to learn off, and so I would just encourage everyone to. Do that as much as possible because it's it's you'll never crack it you just you need to work on it constantly and that would be my sort of final piece of advice and i would add to that i make mistakes every single day <laughs> and yeah. then i have to go back to my team and admit the mistakes and and uh, try to work through how i should have done that better <laughs> but it's it, it's good because ultimately you know you achieve results at the end of it and that's yeah. that's the end goal Edwin, yeah. thank you. It was so nice to connect to you again. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. I hope the audience has all enjoyed that. Um, and um, we look forward to, to seeing more of you. All right. All right thank you very much. Bye-bye.